Well, welcome to a new ministry initiative that I'm really taking hold of in this thing I'm calling the Mike Bickle app. And in this app, I have one key verse that I'm making the theme for the app. And that is John 3, 29, when John the Baptist said, I am a friend of the bridegroom. Now, that's a bit of a strange phrase to most people. But what I'm going to do in the Mike Bickle app is on Mondays, I'm going to do a series of 10 or 12 minute, just uh, short meditations about something related to the end times. Then on Thursdays, I'm going to do a 10 or 12 minute single message, just focusing in on one or two key points related to intimacy with God. Because the friend of the bridegroom ministry of John the Baptist has that element of the biblical narrative, the end time events alongside the intimacy, heart exchange with the Lord. When I first began to understand this a few years back, it was really surprising, perplexing, then delightful. When I understood that the urgency of the end time message and the tenderizing intimacy of the heart connect with Jesus, the bridegroom God, it's really an excellent connection together. I never would have personally put that together. I would never have thought of that. But of course, the Lord did. And so this first session here on the end time focus, on Mondays will be the end time focus. Thursday will be the intimacy with God focus, but all under this banner called Friends of the Bridegroom. So this first session, I'm calling it Friends of the Bridegroom. What is the Friend of the Bridegroom ministry? And of course, this is a bigger subject than one 10-minute little meditation because I'm calling the, the Monday and the Thursday short sessions, I'm calling them all of them under the banner of Friend of the Bridegroom Meditations, either a uh, uh, end time focus or an intimacy with God focus. Well, here again, session one on the end time focus, what is the Friend of the Bridegroom Ministry? And those of you that know me know that I always have a handout. So on each one of these sessions, I'll have a one or two page handout right there uh, on the app. You can get it right there. And I have a master, a master class that I'm teaching, and those are typically eight-part series of master class. I'll do about once every month or sometimes not that often, but usually once a month I'll do a master class. And I'm giving the master class as my thank you for people who are helping join the Mike Bickle Library team. They're helping me $8 a month to create a, a little revenue to pay translators so I can produce and uh, translate, produce, and then distribute free messaging. And we're aiming for 15 different uh, message, uh, fifteen different languages. So I'm asking a bunch of you to join the Mike Bickle Library team. And if you do that, I have a master class that, and a couple more things that I want to give to you just as a thank you for partnering with me. Because I want to give all this stuff away free to the nations, and I'll use every dime of that uh, uh, money on the Mike Bickle Library team to, again, translate, uh, produce, translate, and distribute the message. So I have a master class on what is the Friend of the Bridegroom and eight full sessions. Later on in this year, we'll release that probably in the summer sometime of 2023. But here I'm giving just a little teaser of it, just a little sh a little snapshot of it. And the, and the key passage is John 3.29. And we'll go over this passage so many times, John 3.29. To some of you, it will be a brand new idea, but in a minute, it'll become very familiar. And then a minute after that, and of course, when I say a minute, I, you know, a couple months, a couple years, something like that, uh, it will be one of your favorite verses. Anyway, that's, that's just having fun with you, but it really might be. John the Baptist was the premier model of the forerunner message, the forerunner ministry at the first coming of Christ. He was the man God the Father raised up in a singular way to prepare the, the nation of Israel to understand the Messiah because they had ideas about the Messiah, but many of their ideas were based on false premises. They were based on many on Bible verses, but they didn't interpret them in the right lens through the, through the right way. So their expectations were different from what God was going to do. So God raised up John the Baptist and sent him ahead of time and says, this is what the Messiah will look like. He gave the people a chance to go, hmm, 
That's a new idea. We were not thinking about that because the Forerunner Ministry, as we'll look at in our sec, our second session, session two in this uh, end time focus, we'll do that next. We're going to tell why it's so essential to have the Forerunner Ministry, but just in one sentence, it gets people ready with new ideas so they can interpret them and they can digest them and they can make sense of them so when this new activity of the Lord takes place or activity they were not expecting, They don't resist it, but they embrace it and they voluntarily uh, submit to it and partner with it. And they go, yeah, that's what the Bible said. We were ready for this kind of thing. And so the Forerunner Ministry is giving the message ahead of time so people can kind of wrestle with it and take time to assimilate it and digest it. Well, here it is. John says in John 3, 29, that uh, they came and asked him, who are you anyway? Are you the Messiah? I mean, because he had these large crowds and he had this authority of God resting on him. Then he goes up, he gives this cryptic answer. He goes, he that is a friend of the bridegroom. No, no, no. He that has the bride is the bridegroom. And they go, no, we're asking, who are you? He goes, he that has the bride is the bridegroom. That didn't seem like you're giving me a direct answer, John. But the friend of the bridegroom, speaking of himself, stands before this bridegroom God. And I hear him. I listen intently to him. And my heart greatly rejoices because I've heard the voice of the Messiah of Jesus. But as the bridegroom, I know that he's the bridegroom God. He's not just the savior and the healer and the, and you know, going to build a nation builder. He is all of those, but he's a bridegroom at the core of his personality. Now, John was the very first person to reveal Jesus, the Messiah, as the bridegroom God. Nobody, no other voice before him, first one. And and John was the first person to identify himself as a friend of the bridegroom. And we find out later, and this is more in my master class, I develop it a bit more, though I have quite a bit of this on the Mike Bickle Library right now, but they're typically in one hour messages with, you know, four and six page handouts. And these are little just meditations. But uh, about a year after John did this in John 3, when he said, I am a friend of the bridegroom, about a year later, Jesus told the apostles, you know, John, he's a friend of the bridegroom, but what you don't know, so are you. So are you because you're getting the nation of Israel ready to receive me as the bridegroom God. I'm getting ahead of myself because that was in Matthew chapter 9. I imagine the apostles went, what are you talking about? We're friends of the bridegroom. We thought John was. Well, you both are because it's a preparation ministry for the coming of the Lord. Well, in paragraph B on the handout here, and I won't try to always cover even the one or two pages, but most of these notes are just to give you a little idea where we're going. So you got the verses, you got a couple key pieces of data, because my goal isn't just for you to hear these messages. My goal is for you to take some of this material that touches you, put it in your own handouts. And you know, uh, uh, those of you that know my ministry, I've said this for 40 years, that our copyright's the right to copy. Anything you like in any of my materials, you're free to take it and use it in your materials. I have a joke. I say, put your name on it, put your mom's name on it. I don't care whose name you put on it. You don't have to mention me at all. If you love it and it burns in your heart, it's yours to run with. Well, he starts off, John does, and I'll just take a couple more minutes on this first session. He said, uh, this one that I'm preparing the people for, he is a bridegroom. And that's a huge statement. Again, I've got a couple series on the Mike Bickle Library, uh, like 12-part series, 15-part series on the Bride of Christ, a number of different series on this. That's all, again, it's all free for you to study, but it's a big, big subject. It's a glorious subject. But here's the first declaration of it in, in the New Testament. John 3, 29, Jesus is the bridegroom. And what that means is, well, it means a lot, but just for this short little soundbite here in this session, I, uh, being a bridegroom, he is a bridegroom in the essence of his personality. Meaning being a bridegroom is, isn't just something he does. It's not just a function, it's something that he is. He thinks and he feels and he reasons and he speaks like a bridegroom. He has a bridegroom heart, he has a tenderness, he has a deep longing for commitment not only to receive the commitment, but to give himself in the dearest, most intimate way at the heart level to his people. He has tender love. He has burning desire for his people. 
I love to say the phrase, he's a king with power, but he's a bridegroom with desire, meaning desire for intimate relationship with his people. And that's why in this, on these uh, uh, Monday and Thursday, 10 to 12 minute uh, uh, sessions in my app, I'm putting end times on, on Monday and intimacy on Thursday because the two have to go together. Because John the Baptist would say something like, if you don't understand he's a bridegroom, you're not going to understand my messaging about some of the trouble that he's going to cause when he stirs up nations. It's not going to make any sense to you if you don't know he's doing it for the sake of love. But then John makes this other statement. He says uh, that he that, he that uh, is the bridegroom has a bride. Well, in what sense did Jesus have a bride in the past tense? Well, because from the beginning, way before Genesis 1, God the Father had already planned that he was going to raise up an eternal companion for his son. And that eternal companion would be his bride forever. So from the very beginning, the father conceived of a prepared bride for a worthy son. That was always the plan before Genesis 1. And at the end of the book of Revelation, we see a bride in the Garden of Eden with her bridegroom again. That's really the setting of Revelation 21 and 22. Back to the Garden of Eden, the bride and the bridegroom together again. Well, the, Jesus was so sure of the Father's plan and purpose to bring forth the bride, and he was so determined that he would die on the cross. It's still a, you know, a couple years out. He was so sure that would happen that he spoke with this prophetic certainty he already has the bride. <coughs> Excuse me. There's no power on earth or in hell that's going to stop this. He already has the bride. In his heart, the bride is already his. Then he describes himself. He said, speaking of himself, I'm adding the words. He said, I am the friend of the bridegroom, but that's the implication. He goes, I'm speaking as a friend of the bridegroom. That speaks of a very specific message. As friend of the bridegroom, he's giving a revelation of the bridegroom, but he's also giving understanding of the response of the, of the redeemed as a cherished bride. So the message is vast, many layers, many implications to the revelation of Jesus as a bridegroom and many uh, 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 implications of preparing the church as a cherished bride. Oh, there's, so that's messaging. But then there's a second thing. There's a lifestyle. He has this fasted lifestyle where he is pressing into God with this unusual sense of urgency and intensity, but it's within reach for us to live what I call the fasted lifestyle where we deny some things in our pursuit of the Lord and we're fasting and there's several ways to do that. We'll break it down in some of the sessions, uh, 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 probably in the intimacy with God focus on Thursdays. Although I have a lot of this on my website right now, I got a few series on all of these subjects. I've got, I think, 2,000 messages on the website right now. So a bunch of them on the fasted lifestyle and the bridegroom fast. But it's not only a message and a lifestyle as a friend of the bridegroom. It's a ministry style too. It's really big, a ministry style. What do I mean? Today I notice in the body of Christ, a lot of ministries when they get on the platform, whether it's preachers, whether it's worship leaders, whether it's ministry leaders, musicians, all, they, once they get on the platform, they kind of kick into this, they get these extra antics in their personality and their body language where they're drawing people to themselves. I call them antics. Where they're doing things because they got a crowd, they wouldn't talk or sing that way if nobody was in the room looking at them. And they're drawing attention to themselves. And John the Baptist said, my ministry, I'm a friend of the bridegroom. I'm only going to do what helps the bride connect with the bridegroom. I'm not leading her to me at all. I don't want to do anything to get in the way between their embrace. And that friend of the bridegroom ministry style, I believe the Lord's going to make this very common in the end time church that no matter how anointed you are in preaching, singing, dancing, whatever, you're not going to do any extra little thing up there. So people look at you and go, wow, they're really amazing. But we're going to so lock into getting them to embrace the bridegroom God. And that's part of the Friends of the Bridegroom ministry. Well, he makes two more statements. He goes, he stands and he hears. And I'm, I, I'll uh, unpack this in the master class. And again, I got a lot more on my website if you got the energy to go look for it all. But he stands. He has this diligent attentiveness to stand in God's presence. It's a critical part of the Friend of the Bridegroom ministry. But he doesn't just stand, he listens. 
He actually obeys what he hears. He has this this anointing to go long hours. I call it the anointing to linger long in the presence of God in the prayer and the word and in worship. But he not only stands in that ministry of receiving the word and worshiping, but he, he hears and he obeys. He actually leaves that place of, of standing before God and obeys him. And then he gives the, the, the final thing. He says, I'm filled with joy because I've heard the bridegroom's voice. Now, that's an amazing statement. If you remember, John the Baptist is living out in the wilderness of Judea. So, I mean, it's 90 and 100 degrees often. He's not living in some nice house with air condition, fine foods. He's living in this very rustic lifestyle out there, a lot of it in isolation. I, I believe there was a community that he was associated with through the years. We'll look at that at, at another time. But uh, he's speaking this message and he goes, and I would think, boy, your lifestyle's so rigorous. It's so hard. It's a bit lonely. He goes, no, there's something. When you connect with the bridegroom God, there's something on the inside that comes alive. He goes, when I hear his voice, I don't mean just when I, in person, when he saw Jesus, when he baptized him, more than just hearing it audibly. He goes, when I understand from the spirit and the word that I am ministering before a God who is a bridegroom, a Messiah who's a bridegroom God, by heart, then I know who I am to him, and I know who we are together, and joy arises in my heart. Well, that's enough for this. I went a little bit long here on my first session. I'm going to typically aim to keep this 10 or 12 minutes. So there we have the what is the friend of the bridegroom ministry, just a little hint to get us started on this journey together. Bless you.